Now, there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a member of the Jewish ruling council. He came to Jesus at night and said, Rabbi, we know you are a teacher who has come from God, for no one could perform the miraculous signs you were doing if God were not with him. In reply, Jesus declared, I tell you the truth, no one can see the kingdom of God unless he is born again. How can a man be born when he's old? Nicodemus asked. Surely he can't enter a second time into his mother's womb to be born. Jesus answered, I tell you the truth. No one can enter the kingdom of God unless he is born of water and of the spirit. Flesh gives birth to flesh, but the spirit gives birth to the spirit. You should not be surprised at my saying, you must be born again. The wind blows wherever it pleases. You hear its sound, but you cannot tell where it comes from or where it's going. So it is with everyone born of the spirit. How can this be, Nicodemus asked. You are Israel's teacher, said Jesus, and you do not understand these things. I tell you the truth, we speak of what we know and we testify to what we have seen. But still you people do not accept our testimony. I have spoken to you of earthly things and you do not believe. How then will you believe if I speak of heavenly things? No one has ever gone into heaven except the one who came from heaven, the Son of Man. Just as Moses lifted up the snake in the desert, so the Son of Man must be lifted up, that everyone who believes in him may have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe stands condemned already because he has not believed in the name of God's one and only Son. And this is the verdict. Light has come into the world, but men love darkness instead of light because their deeds were evil. Everyone who does evil hates the light and will not come into the light for fear that his deeds will be exposed. But whoever lives by the truth comes into the light so that it may be seen plainly that what he has done has been done through God. Amen. It's one of those passages that brings to mind all sorts of images, doesn't it? And I'm thinking immediately as I, as I read this particular last section there of the Feast of, of, of Lights and the torches being lit and, every, and everything being exposed. And I remember I mentioned before to you and John and I talked about that. The fact that when, these, when it was said, when these lamps were lit... There wasn't a courtyard in the whole of Jerusalem that escaped the light. And so to be in God's presence meant that everything was exposed. And that immediately makes everyone who reads that very uncomfortable because we know that in every single one of our lives are our areas that we like to keep so pretty private to ourselves. We like to think we are people of mystery, don't we? Especially when you're younger, you like to think you're the mysterious James Bond type. I know I did. <laughs> it didn't last very long. And my wife says, yeah, but I can read you like a book, you know. <laughs> and I was, I was reflecting yesterday, I was thinking about my, my own father, you know, and the things I used to do. And he, and then he would nail it and tell me I'd done something. I said, how did he know that? Simply because he'd been there himself and he understood me. And I suppose our Heavenly Father is exactly the same. But let's begin like this. There's a story told of the citizens of a place called Feldkirch in Austria. They were under attack. Napoleon's army were coming in and they surrounded them. And they didn't know what they were going to do. They'd seen um, some soldiers on the hills surrounding where the village was. And they were really unsure. And they formed a council of citizens to decide what they were going to do. Should we defend ourselves or should we show a white flag? It happened to be on Easter Sunday and they were speaking to the pastor. And the pastor got them into church and he stood up and said, look folks, there's nothing we can do. This is the day of the Lord's resurrection. Let's celebrate that and ring the bells as usual because we know only our weakness and we don't know the power of God to defend us. So let's just get on with it. So that's what they did. The enemy, on hearing the bells ringing, immediately assumed that the Austrian army had come to their defence and they ran away. You see, for all of us, who, to receive or achieve something in life, there's an assumption that we must do something. And the same applies to many when we think of terms of eternity and heaven. 
And although time and again we hear that it's only by God's grace, by the exercise of faith, that we can ever be acceptable in God's presence, it's almost a shock to the system when we reflect on the good things that we do and realise that it's not what we do that matters, but what we are. That our heart has to be open. We have to be open to that which is beyond ourselves. And here we have a beautiful picture of a person who was open. We have a man called Nicodemus, and I call him the man with an open heart. We read in the Bible that when Jesus walked on earth, many different people were attracted to him. It wasn't because he was handsome or wealthy. He might have been, but we don't have any record of what he looked like. It wasn't that, but there was a quality about him that made him special. And when people met him, they wanted to speak to him. They wanted to be loved by him. But there was something else, you see. Jesus speaks constantly of the sovereignty of God, the need to worship him, the necessity of belief, and the acceptance of his grace. And this caused an awful lot of confusion for many people. And in particular, it was the religious leaders. They didn't really quite get it. They felt that their authority was actually being undermined all the time. And Nicodemus was one of the Sanhedrin, which was the Jewish ruling council of the day. So he was a very important person. And this group actually applied God's law to society. Now Nicodemus' interest in Jesus had been aroused because uh, all the things he was saying and all the things he was doing in public. Now at first, thought, Jesus thought that, everyone thought that Jesus was just a, another radical after position. But as time went on, those in authority began to realise that yes, of course, Jesus is a radical. But his life and his actions were actually changing people's lives. And that in both his life and his actions, there was this consistency that was really quite disturbing. And the reason for this was that too many religious leaders had already dismissed him as young and inexperienced. And they weren't happy with the notion that, first of all, they might have to recognise his claims. But also, that would mean swallowing their pride. And then they would have to say in humility that they were wrong. And no one likes to admit that, do they? What really upset the apple cart was when Jesus would be quite happy to walk into the synagogue and challenge the preacher on what he'd said. And consequently, those who were in ministry for the career were suddenly challenged. And as, as far as they perceived that they were in control, they were concerned that there were only two options open to them now. And there were two options. The first one was to respond to the challenge, or secondly, they had to get rid of the one that was challenging them. And we see this picture unfold and it becomes clearer and clearer as we travel through the Gospels, as they, as they started to plot as to how they were going to kill him. Now Nicodemus was one of those people who had a hard time comprehending the idea of salvation as a free gift to them. We're introduced to him here in John chapter 3, then we see him again in chapter 7, verse 50, and then we see him in chapter 19 and verse 39. So then we have to ask, what do we know about him? Well... First of all, we know his name. It's a Greek name, which means victor over the people. Um, that doesn't mean he was a Greek, but his name demonstrates just how much Greek influence and culture had changed life in that time. The second thing we know, and these are the only two things, we know that he was a Pharisee. And of course, most of what we know about the Pharisees actually comes from the New Testament, doesn't it? Yeah? And so really, we, were, we probably got a pretty negative picture of them. Have you noticed, for example, that the Pharisees aren't mentioned in the Old Testament? I did go looking for them. I couldn't find them anywhere. Somewhere between Malachi, that's the last book in the Old Testament, and, and, and Matthew, a period of about 400 years, the Pharisees came into being. Now, historians tend to believe that the sects of the Pharisees developed during the period of the Maccabean Wars. Greek culture was sweeping the world that affected the Jewish people along with everyone else. But among the Jews, there were certain people who wouldn't com compromise with the customs of the Greeks. And there was some abhorrence coupled with the resistance against the fierce religious persecution that was being brought about by a man called Antiochus Epiphanes. I wouldn't like to write his checks, would you? <laughs> Those who stood the line against the compromising with the Hellenistic culture and refused to abandon their faith actually got, gained the name, and the name is Hasidim, which means saints. And it's believed that these Hasidim were the forerunners of the Pharisees of Jesus' day. So with all that information in mind, we have to realise that not all Pharisees were actually self-motivated and ambitious men. They were actually born out of a desire to be faithful to God. And among their number were incredible people. 
people of courage and conviction, sincere and noble men who were willing to give their lives to their faith. And I want you to consider too, that the Pharisees had a lot of things right. They believed strongly in the sovereignty of God. They taught that humanity is responsible for moral choice. In fact, the Pharisees were actually the conservatives of their day. Theological conservatives, I have to say. Okay. They taught that the soul is immortal and that there will be a resurrection from the dead. They believed in the existence of angels and that there would be a day of reward and punishment in the future. There's not much we could disagree with, really, actually. But Nicodemus was not only a Pharisee, he was actually one of the most important leaders of his day in a very prominent position. He says, now there was a man of the Pharisees, verse 1, named Nicodemus, a member of the Jewish ruling council. And note that Jesus refers to him later as Israel's teacher. Now in the Greek, the, the definite article is used, so he's not a teacher, but he is the teacher. So he's a very important guy here. He's clearly a man of influence and of high regard. And the picture that begins to develop in our minds is one of a devoutly religious, a deeply sincere, highly respected religious leader. This is a man who was well educated in the Old Testament law, in the rabbinical teaching and the customs of his people. He was a very moral man. Nicodemus is a man to be admired for the way that he conducted his life. Now, in our first encounter with him, we see that he comes to Jesus at night. Now that's caused a real big stir amongst the commentators. Some say he came because he was afraid. He didn't want to be seen. But I think that kind of goes against his character and all that we said. The majority of commentators say, and I personally agree with this, that he came at night time because it's the only time that they would be uninterrupted. And so the timing really made good sense. And I think it's really quite astute as well. He didn't want to attract the wrong type of attention. He didn't want the constant distractions of people around him. His motives were pure. He wanted answers here. He wasn't there for any other reason than to find out what he could do about his relationship with God. His approach to Jesus begins with a statement of the opinion about him that he'd already developed in his own mind. He says, we know you are a teacher who comes from God because no one could perform the miraculous signs you were doing if God were not with you. Now, we can't disconnect here chapter 3 and chapter 2. We have to connect them together. And actually, what we see is that Nicodemus is in sharp contrast with the people referred to in the last two verses of chapter 2. Remember we got to the end of chapter 2 and we sort of skimmed over it. It says, now while he was in Jerusalem at the Passover feast, many people saw the miraculous signs he was doing and believed in his name. But Jesus would not entrust himself to them, for he knew all men. He did not need a man's testimony about man, for he knew what was in a man. Now there was a man named Nicodemus. See the contrast, that's beautiful, isn't it? In comparison to these people that just wanted to a, a sideshow, who wanted what they could get. These people had a superficial faith in Christ. Their commitment was shallow and it wouldn't last because it was dependent on what they could see and not what they believed by faith. And as a result, Jesus would not entrust himself to them. And do you know, I think the church is full of those kind of people. In the church and around the church. People who have made a commitment, but actually have been there because they've been kind of swept along by the tide. And there's nothing wrong with that, people being swept along by the tide. But because we haven't been maybe on our toes at the time, maybe we've not really thought about it. We've been caught up too. These people have been swept along. They've made commitments. They've been baptized and maybe even come into membership at the church. But because their motive hasn't been pure, and that's not for us to judge, but because of that, Jesus hasn't entrusted himself to them. So they don't know him. And then we wonder why they fizzled away. I'm not saying that's true in everyone's case, but there's evidence there, isn't there? Nicodemus, on the other hand, was a sincere man. He really desired to know the truth about Jesus. He wasn't satisfied with this mere surface understanding of him as Christ and of the mission that he was on. This was a man who wanted more than just spiritual entertainment. He wanted reality. Now, in his interest, he says, is in the signs. He saw Jesus and the miracles that he was teaching. And in John's Gospel, signs means more than just miracles because a miracle is a sign with a secondary purpose. 
And although we've not got a list of things that Nicodemus was referring to, we understand that Jesus and his life and ministry was illustrating time and time again his identity as the Messiah. And Nicodemus was so challenged, and he recognized God's authority being expressed in amazing things that Jesus was doing. You see, when someone appears on the scene regularly, healing the sick, giving sight to the blind, hearing to the deaf, you, you've got to sit up and listen, haven't you? What was happening here was so incredible, and Nicodemus had to do something more. He couldn't just take a cursory glance and say, well, if it's all right for them, and that's what they want. How many times have we heard that? Do you remember the Toronto blessing when that first came about? Mm. Now, instead of searching to see if it was actually real, many people said, well, it's all right for them. And that's the sort of thing you need. We don't need that. The charismatic movement was the same. There's all kinds of prophetic movements that have started, and they've started well, but because people's indifference, instead of embracing these things and looking at them and testing things, we've thrown away opportunity time and time again. The divine power that Jesus displayed. The fact that he wasn't trying to make a name for himself. The fact that he was homeless and he was broke. And he didn't distinguish between what people had in their pockets or the colour of their skin. That was radical. And this absolutely compelled Nicodemus to find out more. Because what had happened, as we saw in the previous chapter, that he even used the court of the Gentiles, the people they existed to convert, to a marketplace. So they didn't have anywhere to pray. And Jesus was so totally different. And it was the attraction of this grace that was absolutely irresistible. He couldn't help himself to be there. Nicodemus didn't just go to see Jesus. He was drawn there. I don't doubt he had one of those nights that we've all had. You know when you lay that side and it goes round in your head and you turn that side. And it's like a screensaver going off in your head, isn't it? You know, the theologian Charles Hodge explained the relationship between divine grace and the human heart. This is what he says. I love this. He says, The doctrines of grace humble a man without degrading him and exalt him without inflating him. Isn't that just beautiful? See, now my reading of the text is that more than likely having to reach the top of his profession as one of the ones in charge, Nicodemus would have been a little dissatisfied with his religion. Forever, it seemed, all through his life, he's aimed to get to the top. He's been encouraged. Come on, Nicodemus, you're one of them. You're the man, you know. And he's been encouraged through it, and he's been coached for all the right reasons. He's had the good mentors. He's finally reached that place. Apart from being high priest, there's nothing else he could do. The only evidence of it working was the strict rules that it applied and the way that folk were just like prisoners to it. And there was nothing living in it. And the people were just earthbound. Then this Jesus appears on the scene. He teaches the same law, but there's a difference. For him, it's alive. And people receive the message gladly, not because it gives them something else to do, but because it becomes part of their lives. And it changes everything. So he went to Jesus one evening, and he goes when it's quiet, and he wants to find out more. Look at verse 2. He says, He came to Jesus at night and said, Rabbi, we know you are a teacher who has come from God, for we know... For we know no one could perform the miraculous signs you were doing if God were not with him. In reply, Jesus said, I tell you the truth. No one can see the kingdom of God unless he's born again. How can a man be born when he's old? Nicodemus asked. Surely he can't enter a second time to his mother's womb to be born. Jesus said, I tell you the truth. No one can enter the kingdom of God unless he is born of water and of the spirit. Flesh gives birth to flesh, but the spirit gives birth to spirit. You shouldn't be surprised at my saying you must be born again. The wind blows wherever it pleases. You hear its sound, but you can't tell where it's coming from or where it's going. So it is with everyone born of the Spirit. You're seeing the change in people, Nicodemus. It's not about the rules that we apply. It's a change in their life. They can't help but live upright, moral lives now because they've imbibed this truth of God into their lives. See, in response to what seems a perfectly straightforward question, Nicodemus, in Nicodemus' mind anyway, Jesus just answers him in riddles or so it seems, but the point is that he was asking the wrong question. What he was actually saying is, who are you, Jesus? Like us, he wanted to answer all his questions before he actually committed himself. Do you remember that moment when, you know, the truth was touching you? I'll find out a bit more. 
I mean, I've told you, I'm sure I've told you this, but I was so challenged at one point. I went to the phone and I phoned my mum, because that's what boys do. And I said, Mum, I've just met someone who says I'm not a Christian. She says, stay away, they're Jehovah's Witnesses. <laughs> <clears throat> There's this immediate fear that she was going to lose me to sue some cult. Now, I'm not picking on Jehovah's Witnesses, but that's what she said. I remember thinking to myself, I, I'm, I'm not going to commit myself. I need to know more. And then I, I remember getting to that point where I thought to myself, you know what? I'm only young. If I make this mistake and... Well, I can get on with my life and put it down to experience. And so I gave up and went for it. The fact was, with all his background, Nicodemus knew that the right question was, what do I require? What do I have to do to know God? How do I understand and fulfill the words of Psalm 24 that we read this morning? Who may ascend the hill of the Lord? Who may stand in his holy place? Only he with clean hands and a pure heart, who does not lift up his soul to an idol or swear by anything false. You know, for up until that point, he knew that if he just didn't do those things, that was good enough. Now he realized he had to be that thing. And that was different. Suddenly he knew it wasn't of himself. And all of this career that he had behind him, all this service he had under his belt, actually meant nothing in the eyes of God. It couldn't earn him his salvation. That was something that only God could give him. And he knew that and he was troubled by it. And that's why it was empty. The truth is God does value his experience. Does value his service. But Nicodemus is never going to know it unless he trusts him. You see, he'd done his religious bit, hadn't he? All his life he'd come from a religious home, probably. He attended worship on the Sabbath. He gave to the poor, took an interest in others. He even read his Bible and prayed. He worked so hard to set an example to be holy. But somehow he felt so soiled. And he got to this exalted position and despite his achievement, despite all of his efforts, and despite the fact he was probably an all-round nice guy, he didn't know God. He wanted to know him more and he knew he was missing out. And what I think is great about this story is that Jesus knew what he was asking, although he knew he wasn't asking it directly. And he knew his heart and he gives him the answer. Unless a man is born again, Nicodemus... He cannot see the kingdom of God. And completely puzzled, I don't think it really was, but he switches into logic mode. How can a man be born when he's old? How can I enter a second time my mother's womb? And he's referring to, he's reverting, isn't he, to Pharisee mode. You know, he suddenly saying, well, so what do you think about this? You know, and then Jesus responds to his confusion and he explains it as clear as day to him. Now Nicodemus understood because he understood the, the temple rites. He understood that people would be baptised and they were regarded as born again in the temple. He understood the language that Jesus was using. He understood the pictures. But what he couldn't get over was the fact that here he was, was a Jew of the Jew, a Pharisee of the Pharisees. And now he was required to go back to being a convert. It was almost like a demotion for him. And that's probably the hardest thing, isn't it? Especially when we're older, when we've got all that experience under our belt of life. When we've maybe read plenty of books and all of a sudden we realise that actually we haven't been seeing the truth. Well, what does born again mean? What does it really mean? See, the trouble with our language is it is in a constant state of flux. And a phrase such as born again has been hijacked so often that in a public realm it means a totally different thing to what the Bible talks about. I mean, not so long back, Volkswagen used it. Do you remember that advert? Mm -hmm. I was going to bring a copy of it, actually. You know, the born again golf. And it's interesting. Do you notice they use the image of water as well? They cover it in water and the water licks off it. So it's born again, you see. What a clever idea. Funny they have to go to the Bible for their ideas, isn't it? In religious terms, if someone says they're a born-again Christian, then they're regarded as either some sort of super-Christian or slightly fanatical or a little bit eccentric. Jehovah's Witnesses, you know, and I remember them come to my door. I had a really good chat with this lady. And um, they honestly believe that 
anyone who says they're born again of the Spirit of God is demon-possessed. Did you know that? They don't readily admit it, but she did. Sometimes it's a popular label, particularly amongst American politicians, when they are canvassing for support in the, in the Bible Belt. But, you know, it's also a term of naivety for many Christians. Notice we had some American friends, and I'm not into American bashing, but I'm going to tell you this story because it's true. We had some American friends who were staying in a home, and we got into this political discussion. But they were unable to be objective because, you see, for them, at that time, George W. Bush claimed to be a born-again Christian, so there was no other option. You had to vote for him, regardless of his policy. I can't believe it. And when I told them who I thought their only statement was, <laughs> there was absolute shock, and I was called a pagan. You know, I find it interesting that religious belief and feeling and morality is never mentioned when a politician is canvassing for the pink vote, or for support from industry, or fracking for shale gas, or dealing with the unions, or social provision, or the NHS. And this is not being judgmental, it's just plain fact to the inconsistencies that exist in our world. Many ordinary folk are exactly the same and would rather run with the tide of public opinion or the majority than stand up and be counted. And you know, they're just them sort of people. Jesus would not entrust himself to them for they knew all, he knew all men. He did not need man's testimony about man for he knew what was in a man. What the phrase of born again actually means from a biblical point of view is that when someone becomes a Christian, they experience a spiritual birth. And it's a major event in life. And the act of baptism that follows is evidence of that fact that there is a dying to self and symbolically and publicly rising again to new life, saying, I am living for Jesus. I belong to him. So let me illustrate. For nine months, we are in a safe environment of our mother's womb. And then within a, a matter of hours, as a struggle goes on and a process of birth happens. And this is a momentous occasion. No one can doubt that. But certainly for the mother, it's no small matter. And the event of bringing a child into the world is something that's been prepared for for a long time. And the mother, for, it means all this endurance and for pain, oh, it's awful. And for the father, well, ladies, you haven't got a clue what us blokes going through. <laughs> Just thinking about the waiting that goes on. The fact that we don't like seeing our wife in that state and we want to do something for her. But then you've got to make use of the time, haven't you? And I've always found the labour suite a very good place for evangelism because the medical staff have got a captive audience. They can't go anywhere, can they? And it always came as a bit of a shock to me that my wife never really understood or appreciated that we must make the most of every opportunity. <laughs> In fact, I remember one stage, I was chatting to the nurse, and she's with the baby like this, and I was saying, and did you know what the Bible says? And, I was, <laughs> <laughs> and, 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 and she's, she's looking at me like this, and Mary, and Mary says, Bob! And I went, yes, dear, you got my undivided attention. And she goes, I've never had your undivided attention. I went, so. See, likewise, spiritually, God in Jesus Christ has prepared the way for us if we're willing to be born. And what we're speaking of is not just a minor alteration to our social schedule, it's a radical change. It doesn't mean that your personality will be smothered, but that God will take us as we are with all the potential that's bound up in our life. And by his Holy Spirit will actually help us to make our right decisions and take on right priorities and begin to understand what life is really about. So forming the relationship between the father and a child. And this is the way Jesus was saying to Nicodemus. And the effects of it are seen in the lives of those who believe, just as it is with the wind blowing in the trees. But what's more important, says Jesus, it's all by faith. Now this is a concept that Nicodemus understood because for 400 years, the people hadn't heard from God and they knew it was about faith. They had to trust the Lord. And besides, the scriptures were quite clear that the people of God have to live by faith or not at all. And this was the essence of their relationship with him. Faith, you see, was, this was a big question for Nicodemus with all his certainties that were now so uncertain. He knew that the right direction was going that way. 
but he needed no more. And Jesus answers his major question with the help and just helps him to see that a bit more clearly. Some people believe that he became a Christian. I don't know. One day we will. And so finally, the same falls on you and me. As we come with our questions, do we fit in the category of those who desire to know God more? But despite all our efforts, there seems to be a point where we just can't seem to move on. We seem, our prayers hit the ceiling and we come against that barrier. Here's another question for you. Just how real is your religion? Have you been born again by the Spirit of God? Or are you earthbound by the delusion that you've got things covered and that you are in control? Well, I tell you, that is a delusion. We continue next week. Let's pray, shall we? Now, Father, we thank you for the Nicodemus, for the fact that he had the bottle to go and speak to Jesus. The fact that in spite of all the importance of his own position, he was willing to swallow his pride and ask questions about his own life. We ask that as he, you spoke to him and as your Holy Spirit ministered to him, you would do the same for us. For those of us who have met you, who you have entrusted yourself to, we pray that you will confirm that again in our lives and encourage us to love you that bit more. For those of us who don't know you, I pray that you will minister to us and help us just to put those barriers down and to realise that we need to be born again of the Spirit of God. Knowing that we're not just going to become part of a sect or weird in some way, but we're going to enter into relationship with the living God. Thank you for a living relationship. Thank you for your salvation. Encourage us, we pray, to trust you more. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.